Okay, continuing on for our, from our previous video where we talked about thermodynamics a little bit, uh, I wanted to actually put some numbers with that and give you an introduction to why it's relevant by showing you what happens in free energy terms during a temperature change. Uh, but first, I thought it might be useful to actually be able to visualize entropy a little bit. So here is kind of what it looks like. So on the left, ice. On the right, liquid water. So notice the drastic difference here. One is clearly very ordered, the other is clearly not so. And that's what we began with when we introduced the concept that one of the most obvious ways to look at disorder is going from the solid phase where everything is held tightly together and in a relatively orderly fashion towards the liquid and then into the gas phase where there's basically no order at all. Um, if you wanted to visualize what the gas would look like here under normal conditions, you'd have one water molecule spinning around here and the next one would be about five feet away from you in each direction. So it takes up a lot more volume um, when we go from the solid to the li very little change in volume from solid to liquid. Uh, remember the liquid is more dense, which is why if you put liquid water in a, in a container in the freezer, um, it can break it because it expands as it freezes. But as we go towards the gas phase, there's basically a massive expansion. Again, at STP, one mole of liquid water takes up 18 milliliters approximately. Uh, one mole of gaseous water would take up 22.4 liters. So a thousand times, more than a thousand times more space. So this is just to give you an idea of what that physically looks like. Now, as we go back to thinking about this as a chemical equation rather than models or just ice melting on the sidewalk, we have a couple of points we have to talk about. One, we've dealt with enthalpy before. So we have numbers for things like this. We have the enthalpy of fusion. We know what it takes to actually melt this. We can look it up. It's actually really easy. So we have tables of this. Simple. Um, that is a standard value. The more problematic version is the entropy. Now, when we look at delta S, we're usually looking at a difference between, in this case, what would be the liquid and the solid. So product minus reactant. The way I have it drawn, the liquid is the product, which means that the, heat, the enthalpy of fusion here is a positive number. That's going to be important in a moment. So where am I going to get values for these things? The standard enthalpies for the liquid and the gas. Uh, your textbook has a large table of them at the end. Now, a couple of things to be careful with. <clears throat> One, there is a column in this table for delta G. Don't use that. There are rare cases to use it, but they generally get you in trouble. So I would suggest just staying away from that in general, at least for quite a while. Second, the organization of it is a little strange. Uh, it's basically organized by the central atom of a molecule or, um, and so you could have more than one way to find it. And again, this is not anywhere near a comprehensive table. It's supposed to cover relatively simple substances. Um, so, if we look under hydrogen, that's not where we're going to find it. So we only have a few things under hydrogen. Water in any form is not one of them. So it's going to be organized under oxygen. But Murphy's Law would have it. We have the gas. We have the liquid. It doesn't have the solid. Okay, that occasionally happens and we have to go dig. Um, be very careful with this. Now, this is me telling you my own mistakes and the fact that I refuse to wear my glasses when I should sometimes, but I have made this mistake several times now where I've been doing something in class and just looked down at a textbook and pulled the number out and I used the H2O2 ones instead of the H2O ones or one of each and got screwed up because I know what the answer should be and I couldn't make them work and that's what it turned out to be was I just need to wear my glasses, but I do sometimes and don't like to wear them in class because it's just one of those things. So. Um, as it turns out, I have the numbers for this so we can work with it, but most of the time you're able to find what you want in the tables in the back of the book, not all the time. Now, important 
other qualifier, which I mentioned before, that little zero here, sometimes called a naught, so S naught, delta G naught, is at standard thermodynamic conditions, which is one atmosphere pressure and room temperature, 25 degrees C. That's important. If we're far from that, delta H doesn't change very much. Delta G does. Uh, sorry, delta S does. So we have to be really careful if we're going to go far away from this particular set of conditions because the entropy does change based on temperature. So be careful with that. And I'll show you what an error looks like with that later. But it, it is a, a, a place where you can get caught and make some really stupid mistakes because of the fact that the entropy does change. All right, so let's have a look. So the liquid version is 69.9 joules per mole kelvin now a few things um, the gas just for completeness so we have everything together here is 47.9 okay now two things to pay attention to i don't know how i can make it any clearer but people still do this to me every semester and it, it almost makes me want to pull my hair out and considering that I have long hair that would be a considerable effort on my part. Um, one, this is not the same unit as this. One of them's going to have to go when we start talking about delta G where we combine the two. One of them's going to have to match the other. Typically if we're talking about free energy it's in the same terms and, and magnitude as delta H, so we tend to report that in kilojoules per mole. Delta S, because it's a much smaller quantity, tends to be reported, as it was in the table, right here, as joules per mole Kelvin. I'm not trying to trick you and make you think about units. This is how they're reported, kilojoules per mole for the larger quantities, joules per mole Kelvin for entropy. So you have to be aware of that. Otherwise, when you put them together, you get some ridiculous numbers. Seems like I might have seen that before at some point. Yeah. I've taught this class for a lot of years at this point, and no semester goes by without at least a couple of people doing that. So, next point here. And this one really is about paying attention to the units. This. When we are talking about energy calculations, temperature is a reflection of that energy. The idea being no energy would be no temperature. That's the Kelvin scale, not centigrade. So be careful with that. Your temperatures need to be in Kelvin for this to work. Okay, so let's go forward to this, see what we can do here. So I'm going to put this on, an, on a, another screen. Uh, we'll redraw this just so we can keep in Keep in mind what we're talking about. And what we had before with the equation that I talked about in the previous video was this. This is the Gibbs free energy equation, or the Gibbs equation. Now, we had, um, although I didn't subtract them in the previous slide, delta S for those two is 22. Point zero joules per mole Kelvin. Delta G, delta H was the heat of fusion, the heat of the enthalpy of fusion, and that is six point zero one positive six point zero one kilojoules per mole. Now, the phase change point. The phase change happens at a temperature, and at a temperature where the phase change is happening. This is truly an equilibrium, which means at the phase change point, there is no net change. Both of these will be present, and they will be going interconversion in both directions at the same rate. So at equilibrium, in this case, physical equilibrium is the, in this case, the melting point, but at the phase change, delta G is zero. So, 
just to verify that our numbers are not wrong. And this is the type of place where you can find out if you read the table wrong, is by double checking things like this. If I do that here, so first let's go ahead and take this up and say, all right, this is 0 0.0220 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. If I do this um, and say, okay, delta G zero is zero, well, if that's the case, then I can say that delta H is T delta S. And again, this is at the phase change point only that this is true. So these are all assuming that we're at the phase change. So I can then say, well, my, my phase change temperature will be this. So I'm just rearranging what I have left of the Gibbs free energy equation to solve for T. So that's all I'm doing. So if I do that, my T for the phase change is 6.01 kilojoules per mole divided by 0 0.0220 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Now, if I've done this right, we should recognize that number real quick. So, it is 273.18 Kelvin. Okay, so the correct value is 273.15. So obviously there's a rounding error here. We need a few more significant figures to actually get this last decimal place to be right. We're going to take that for the moment because let's be realistic that the tables are not giving us enough decimal places to get this last place with accuracy. This is, you know, a fifth significant figure. We only have three in each of these measurements here. So really the best I should say is 273, but I want you to see how close it really is. Um, so probably the, the fourth and fifth digits off of these, you know, 22.0 something and 6.01 something would give us that. If we had five significant figures in each of those, we'd probably get 273.0 one five or the exact decimal places we need but this is about as close as we're going to get okay so what that tells me is that okay this does make sense this gives me a phase change number which is pretty close to what i expect also remember we're using a standard entropy so that is going to change somewhat with temperature so if that changes slightly well so will this temperature that i solved for we'll see that trick again later but it doesn't change drastically here so we get away with it it's off by a a hundredth of a degree or so so we can get away with that all right so the question of spontaneity though is different and again same equation and i had my delta h which was 6.01 kilojoules per mole my delta s is 0 0.0220 joules per mole Kelvin. So, what we just did was 273. That tells me the phase change. Remember that if delta G is positive, is negative, this is spontaneous as written, meaning left to right. If delta G is positive, now what I said last time was it means it's non-spontaneous. What it really means is that it's spontaneous in the opposite direction. So for reactions, that means it would be spontaneous from right to left. So let's have a look at what we actually get out of this if we do three different temperatures. So let's go to 63 Kelvin, 273 Kelvin, we know what that's going to be already and 283 Kelvin. So I'm going to do the same equation. Delta G is delta H minus T delta S. Only now we're not at equilibrium except for very close to that middle temp. So we're not going to get a delta G that's zero. We're not going to have massive numbers here, but what we're going to see is what's important to us here is this. At 263, 
delta G is positive. Positive 224 kilojoules per mole. At 273, give or take a decimal place, this is zero. At 283, we're looking at minus 216 kilojoules per mole. And these are tiny energy changes, but remember, we're not looking at drastic changes in conditions here either. These are, these are relatively close to the freezing point. So what can we say about this? At 263, remember this is minus 10 degrees C, for those of you who don't spend enough time with the Kelvin scale yet. At that point, this process is going exclusively to the left. A liquid sample of water at that temperature is going to very quickly become a completely solid sample. There will be no liquid phase left at this temperature. It's spontaneous and drives towards the solid phase. Here, at plus 10 degrees C, well now, look at it, it's negative. So that means that this reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. Well, surprise, surprise, I take the ice out of the freezer, I put it on the countertop, and it very shortly will become a liquid. It will completely melt as it reaches this temperature or a reasonable temperature above, above freezing. So this is the applied thermodynamics to phase change in that we can basically, for starters, if we didn't already know it, work out the temperature for the phase change. Sometimes, be careful with that. And then by putting in those same values, we can actually watch the directionality change. Now, this is not as critical for phase changes because we already kind of knew that below the freezing point, things freeze, and above the freezing point, they melt. Um, but this is much more important when we use this same equation and we're talking about chemical reactions where there's not a given simple answer that if I warm it up, it's gonna go one way and I cool it down, it goes the other. That's not always clear to us. So it's not always so simple. So this is how we're going to actually be dealing with that, is that we'll have different temperature values to go with the equation that we have. We'll look at delta G and does it change directions. So before we go there, let's look at it qualitatively. So our equation, let's look at it qualitatively. Our equation is this. Now again, if we have experimental values, we wouldn't have to use the standard values we have here, but we'll leave the zeros for the moment. Um, it's also true if I have this, so you know it doesn't have to be standard values all the time. Uh, but what we want to do is qualitative here. So first, T is always positive. In the Kelvin scale, T is always a positive number. So I have four different possibilities here. And that is delta H is either positive or negative. Delta S is positive for those two. Or delta H, if it's positive or negative, will have a negative entropy. Now, in some of these cases, we're in great shape. So think about it. This term is a negative number, which means if T is positive and S is positive, this term becomes negative. So if I've already got a negative delta H and I have a positive delta S, that's this one, delta G is negative at all at all temps. That's the best of the lot. When we get that, we're golden. So a lot of very energetic reactions are like that. Um, combustion reactions typically fit into this type of problem, that they have a negative delta H, they give off a lot of heat, and they're becoming more disordered because you're breaking down complex molecules. So entropy in those cases is usually, delta, is usually positive. So we will see other reactions like that. It is, of course, the best of all cases here. And as you might expect from life in general, the best of all cases is not all that common. So what happens in the other direction? 
what happens if delta H was positive in those cases? Well, then we have a case where it depends on quantity. I need this negative term to overpower that positive delta H here. So I need this term to be bigger. So this is a conditional case where this will be negative, but it'll be negative at higher temps. Because that is the multiplier going by delta S. So the higher T, the bigger the T delta S term becomes, and it's got a negative sign in front of it, so that then shifts delta G towards being negative. Eventually it will overtake delta H. The other two cases, the third one is exact opposite of the ideal case that I did second, which is I'm going to have a positive number now for delta H. I'm going to have a negative delta S, and that sign is going to get changed by the negative sign in the equation. So this is non-spontaneous at all temps. So this is a case where I really have a problem. Um, if I have to do a reaction like that, it is not not easy. Um, it is it is unfavorable both in enthalpy and entropy terms. So when that happens, you have your challenge cut out for you. All right, the last one, same thing as before, but now same thing as the first one, except for now, I want delta H to be the dominant portion here because that negative sign here is going to get changed by the negative sign in the equation. So this term I want to minimize here. So this one's going to be negative, but only at lower temps. So that I'm minimizing the T delta S term. So qualitatively, we can kind of figure out whether the reaction is going to be temperature dependent or not by looking at this. It's not perfect, of course, because delta S does change with temperature quantity wise. So in cases that are temp dependent, that's the first and the last one, then I have to take into account that delta S is not a constant depending on what the temperature is. Um, so this is a qualitative way of looking at whether a, a process, a phase change or um, or a chemical reaction is spontaneous or not. Now, let's go back and look at the ice, ice to, solid, to liquid water example. So we'll go back to the very start of it here. So delta H here is positive. Um, as I did this, I realized I made a mistake as we're going along. Um, this is supposed to be the solid. So this is this is the solid, not the not the gas. Um, I saw reactant, so it's still the math is correct. So this is still twenty two um, point oh joules per mole kelvin. Just labeled it incorrectly. So just pay attention to that when you go back and review this video. That the first part of it has that labeled as a gas, even though there's no gas in this equation. Just a typo or a, a righto since I'm not typing. So um, what we have here is. We have a case where delta H is a positive value and delta S is a positive value. Does this match up to what we saw in that previous one? So this is the case. So for this phase, phase change, I have a positive delta H, I have a positive delta S. Delta G becomes spontaneous as I increase the temperature, which is exactly what we saw here, that it was not spontaneous, and then I begin to warm it up, which is equilibrium, where there's no change in energy, no free energy change. Then as I continue raising the temperature, it becomes spontaneous. So this is the quantitative version of that qualitative look at direction. So we're going to use this quite a lot um, in terms of interpreting reactions later on, as well as interpreting solutions before we get to the reactions chapter. This is this is just understanding what's actually going on thermodynamically. Um, we're going to go into one more phase change problem because I want, you, I want you to see the error that's possible and how we might get around it by using those standard values. So that'll be the next video.